Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. How long are you going to be sad? How long are you going to live in regret? Boy, regret is a power drainer. I wish I wouldn't have. I wish I would have. Well, if you didn't, you didn't. And if you did, you did. And so this is today. And let's be now, people. Because faith is now. Faith is not yesterday. Faith is not tomorrow. Today, I have faith that God can take care of yesterday. And today, I have faith that God will take care of me tomorrow. I want to catapult you out of any kind of doldrums or deadness or any, anything that's holding you back because you have the power of God in you and it's never too late to begin again. No matter what has happened to you in your life, no matter what you've done or what's been done to you, it is never too late to press into a new beginning. Never too late. But your future has no room for your past. So today is the day where mourning is going to end. And we're going to get plan B from God, which always stands for better. So you may think, well, I messed up God's plan for my life. I messed up plan A. Well, you know, the truth is, is even if you did, it doesn't matter all that much because if you go to God and say, I know that you can redeem me, his plan B can be better than plan A ever would have been. First Samuel chapter 16, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing that I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Now, you know, Samuel was the one that had anointed Saul to be king, and he had worked with him. And, you know, when you put a lot of time into something and a lot of prayer time into something, it, it's really hard if it just fails and flops. Well, Saul just did not turn out to be what he could have been. It wasn't God's fault, it wasn't Samuel's fault, it wasn't the people's fault, it was Saul's fault. And really what happened was he got all full of himself, he got all proud and got a haughty attitude and God ended up having to take him down from that high place that he had allowed him to be in. Now, Samuel was mourning, he was sad because of what had happened to Saul. And so the Lord spoke to Samuel, to the prophet Samuel. He said, how long are you going to mourn for Saul? I've rejected him. That's over. Now he says, fill your horn with oil and I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king from among his sons. Let me tell you something. God is never without a plan. <laughs> Do you hear me? I, e even though there's so many problems in our nation right now, I believe God's got a plan. If he can just get somebody to stand up and take some action, or several somebodies, God's got a plan. And God's got a plan for your life, and a plan for your family, and a plan for your employment, and a plan for your health, and all you have to do is not get this attitude, well, it's just too late. I've messed my life up, and it's just too late. I guess I'll just sit around here and have a bad attitude until Jesus comes to get me. <laughs> No, we can't do that. How long are you going to mourn? You know, under the Old Testament law, and I find this very interesting, they were only allowed to mourn for 30 days. It was a law. That when someone died, they could only mourn for 30 days. Now, I know that sounds harsh, and I'm not suggesting that if you've lost someone that you love, that you should just get over it in 30 days. But I think there's a principle here. How long did I mourn because I was abused in my childhood and my parents really didn't and never would love me. Not, not, not what real love is anyway. How long did I mourn over that? And how many years did I waste? Well, a lot more than I want you to waste if something like that has happened to you. And I want you to learn from my experience that it does absolutely no good to mourn over something that you cannot do anything about. Amen. Amen. How long are you going to mourn? How long are you going to be sad? How long are you going to live in regret? Boy, regret is a power drainer. I wish I wouldn't have. I wish I would have. Well, if you didn't, you didn't. And if you did, you did. And so this is today. And let's be now people. 
because faith is now. Faith is not yesterday, faith is not tomorrow. Today I have faith that God can take care of yesterday and today I have faith that God will take care of me tomorrow. Why did Jesus call himself the great I am? And why did God say I am that I am? Because he wasn't the great I was. <laughs> Nor did he call himself the great I will be. There's a message here. He said, I am. I am. Why are you frightened and distressed? I am. I am here right now for you in your life, right where you are at today. And everything can change in a moment if you start heading in the right direction. I'm not saying that all your problems will be gone the minute you walk out of this building, but at least you can start heading in the right direction by having a brand new attitude toward life. Letting go of what lies behind. We've all got a past, but thank God we've all got a future. Amen. Amen. Deuteronomy 34, 7 and 8. Moses was 120 years old when he died, and his eye was not dim, nor was his natural force abated. I love that. When Moses was 120 years old and he died, he was still just as strong as a young man. And the Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. Joshua chapter 1. Verse 1, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Well, <laughs> you know, you, you can read that and just get nothing out of it, but to me, this says a whole lot more because they obviously already knew that Moses was dead. They'd already been mourning Moses 30 days. So why now did God show up and say again, Moses is dead? Because there was a deeper message there. He was saying, now it's time to let go of that and press on. Come on. If you had a dream that's been shattered, it's time to let go of that and get a new dream. It's try, it's, if, if you had a failure in the past, you're not a failure because you did something that didn't work. There's always an opportunity for a new beginning. You can always begin again. Amen? Moses is dead. So now arise, I love that, get up and get going. So arise and take his place and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land which I am giving them. Verse three is so important to our lives. Every place upon which the sole of your foot shall tread, that have I given to you as I promised Moses. You see, God was saying, I've already got the path all laid out. Everything's already arranged. God's already done everything that he needs to do. Now he says, you get up, forget the past, and start moving forward. And every place on which the sole of your foot treads, that have I already given you. It's yours, but you got to go take it. Come on, you ought to be more excited than that. He didn't say, go get in the recliner and I'll deliver it to your front door. And that's the way we act sometimes. I'm going to go get in the recliner and lean back here. And, you know, God's just, I just need a miracle, God. I need a miracle. God says, get up. <laughs> Forget the past. And every place on which the sole of your foot treads. Come on, you need to do some things for yourself in your life. There's some things that only you can do. And if you won't do them, nothing is ever going to work in your life. Let me tell you a, a sad but an important story. It's been on my heart this weekend to share this with you, although I have shared it before. But there's somebody here this morning that needs to hear this. I had one sibling, a brother. I say had because just a few years back, three, four years ago, he, he died in an abandoned building out in California. 
homeless, addicted to drugs and alcohol, and prescription medicine. You say, Joyce, how in the world could your brother be in that situation? Because no matter what we did for him, he wouldn't do anything for himself. You cannot fix somebody that doesn't want to be fixed. But you can ruin your life trying. My brother went into the Marines when he was 17. Although he was not sexually abused, he was abused in that he never really had a father and any example my father was to him was a bad example. And he went into the Marines when he was 17. My parents signed the papers and while he was in Vietnam, he got introduced to drugs and he continued to have a problem with that all of his life. You say, well, poor guy, maybe he couldn't have helped it. Well, you know, my brother was always irresponsible. He always wanted somebody else to do it for him. He had this mentality that somebody else should do it for him. That was one of the reasons why the Israelites stayed in the wilderness so long. They had that same attitude, somebody do it for me. Every time they would get in trouble because they made bad choices, they would blame Moses and even blame God and want to run back to Egypt. That's why what I shared last night is so important. Even when you're hurting, you got to keep going forward. You got to keep doing what you would do if you weren't hurting. And so my brother was just the nicest guy. I mean, you would have loved him to pieces. I mean, he had the personality, he had the charisma, he had the looks. I mean, he was a good looking guy and so much fun and just very encouraging and just, just had so much potential. And I don't think there's anything that's any sadder than somebody with so much potential doing nothing, absolutely nothing, zippo zero with their life. It's terrible, it's tragic. Do not waste your life. Don't waste your life. And please don't have an attitude that somebody else needs to do for you what you're supposed to be doing for yourself. We all have to be responsible for ourselves. We have to own our own problems. We have to own our own behavior and not blame. Well, I wouldn't act this way if you didn't. No, no. If a person acts bad, it's because there's something going on in them that needs to be fixed. And until we take responsibility for that, nothing's ever going to change. Anyway, my brother came home from the war and and it did have a negative effect on him, no doubt about that. He got married, didn't stay married too long, had a child, wouldn't support the child. He was one of these dads that wouldn't pay child support. And he just disappeared and lived out in Arizona for many, many, many years. And after a lot of years, we got a phone call one day that he was desperate for help, wanted to change his life, wanted to come home. Would we come and get him? So. We sent him an airline ticket. He came home, we met him at the airport. Some of his teeth were missing. His health was so bad, he just looked pitiful and pathetic. My only brother, I loved him. I didn't have the privilege of being around any family, so I was glad to see him. And we brought him into our home and David lived with us for over two years. And as long as he lived with us and I was watching him and telling him step by step what to do, he did good. He got off the drugs, he got off the alcohol. We eventually let him work at the ministry. He traveled with us. I mean, it was, he just had, he had so much opportunity, it was disgusting. I mean, he, he could have been in a high position in this ministry and traveled all over the world if he would have stuck it out. But some different things happened, and one of the things that happened was as soon as he got back in the Social Security system, the government came after him for this back child support, which was about $60,000. Well... He felt defeated by that and like he could never crawl out from under it. We had a lawyer help him and they got it reduced down to a lower amount, although it was still, you know, a fair amount of money. And they started garnishing his wages and he didn't want to be responsible. He should have manned up and said, I deserve this. I didn't do what I should have done and now I need to pay this and I don't care how long it takes, I'm going to pay it. 
And if he would have had that attitude, Dave and I already had plans to help him. But we waited to see what he would do. I wonder how often God is not helping somebody yet because he's waiting to see what they will do. Now, come on, I think this is a word for somebody in the place today. You don't understand why God's not moving, yet you're waiting on God, but maybe God's waiting on you. Amen. Will you be responsible and say, I made this mess. It's right for me to spend some years cleaning it up. I spent more money than I had. Now I've got a lot of debt. That means I'm going to have to live very lean and maybe work extra hard for four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. But I deserve it. God, I'm going to do what I can do and trust you to do what I can't do. You begin to be responsible. Then you start getting the miracle working power of God in your life. So after about two years, I felt very strongly, and Dave agreed that it was time for my brother to get out on his own. I didn't need to be raising a 50-year-old man. And uh, so we helped him get an apartment, signed for an apartment. We got him a nice truck. He had a good job. We helped him get some furniture, everything. I mean, I don't think it was three weeks. And he started going right back to his old lifestyle. Well, long story short, he ended up leaving town again, was gone a few more years, and the only time he would call me was when he was in trouble. Well, sis, can you help me? I'm in jail. No, David, I'm not getting you out of jail. Well, you're a minister. You're helping everybody else. Well, you know. <laughs> Come on, you can't let somebody put a guilt trip on you because they're not doing what they should be doing. And then one of the women he was living with actually called. She got a hold of my son-in-law, and she wanted me to set up a bank account for her and my brother <laughs> because they were in this terrible condition, and they needed help. And, you know, she calls herself a minister. And you know what? You better know who you are in Christ because the devil will try to heap a load of guilt on you that you don't need to take. You need to be responsible for you, but you need to let everybody else be responsible for them. I'm all for helping people, but I'm not for helping people who just want to use me and won't help themselves. Now, I don't know why in particular I felt so strongly about bringing this up today, but maybe it's just a word in due season for somebody. Amen. We don't help people by continuing to cripple them. Are you there? Real love sometimes has to be a little bit tough. So he finally called again, wanted to, I need help. We got him in a treatment program, sent somebody to get him. We got him in a treatment program, actually the Los Angeles Dream Center where I know the, the Barnett's out there and I knew they would take good care of them. And they had even told me on the side, if he does well, we'll even give him a job here. And I was like, great, another opportunity. He was there 30 days. Got off the drugs, off the alcohol, he was cleaned up. They had put him to work as a plumber because he had plumbing skills. He went to the guy that was the head of the program and he said, you know what, you guys are great. I really appreciate your help, but this is just not for me. I'd like you to just take me to the VA center and drop me off. Okay, you know why he wanted to be dropped off there? Because he wanted to get some pain medicine. And sadly, he died in an abandoned building. How terrible. How terrible. He'd actually been there so long that they couldn't even recognize him by his remains. But you know how they recognized him? He had his wallet, and in his wallet, he still had his badge from Joyce Meyer Ministries when he worked for us. You know why I think he had that? I think that was one thing in his life that he was proud of. That was a time in his life. That was a time in his life when he had some self-respect. We cannot respect ourselves if we expect everybody else to do for us what we should be doing. I'm telling you right now, it is not too late for you. 
Please listen to me. It is not too late for you. You can shake off that depression. You can shake off that discouragement. You can shake off what everybody has said and what everybody has done. You can find healing. There is redemption. There's a new beginning for you in Jesus Christ. It is not too late for you. Don't you believe that lie that it's too late for you? Refuse to be trapped in the past. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Not that I've already attained this ideal or have already been made perfect, but I press on to lay hold of and make my own that for which Christ Jesus the Messiah has laid hold of me and made me his own. This has become one of my favorite scriptures. Not, he, not just the fact that Paul said, I press on, but what he said he was pressing on to obtain. He said, I am determined to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus died to take hold of me. In other words, he's saying, Christ died for me to have a quality of life that is absolutely, astoundingly amazing, and I am going to press in and press on until I have that life that he died for me to have. Come on, is anybody home in the building today? You can have better health. You can have self-respect. You can have your financial needs met. You can have relationships. No matter how bad you've been hurt in the past, you can love again. Don't isolate yourself and cut yourself off from everybody just because you're afraid of being hurt. You're hurting yourself if you're living an isolated, lonely life and living in fear of ever being involved with anybody. And I can probably go ahead and tell you, if you get involved with people, you will get hurt. Let's just be upfront and truthful about it. But you'll recover because the healer lives on the inside of you. Yeah. Verse 13, I do not consider, brethren, that I've captured and made it my own. But one thing I do, it is my one aspiration. Do you feel his passion? Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I, it was almost like he's saying the past is after me trying to hold me back, but I'm straining, I'm pressing. It's my one passion, my one goal. I'm going to have the life that Jesus wants me to have. And to be honest, that is my passion as a preacher. We have a lot of people saved under our ministry, but I am not mainly an evangelist. I am a teacher of the Word, and I have a particular niche in my teaching. From the time that God has called me to teach the Word, I've had this passion to teach believers how to stand up and be the people that God wants them to be and have what God wants them to have. I absolutely cannot stand whippy, whiny, beat up, beat down believers. That is not what Jesus died for us to have. Well, I would just like to encourage you to just make your mind up that you're not going to live in disappointment, regret, or even the shadow of past failures. And allow God to give you a new beginning. He's waiting to do that, you know. There's a new beginning for you. It's never too late to begin again. Philippians 3.13, the Apostle Paul said, But one thing I do, it was really important to him, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. You know, today we want to help you really be encouraged and to not let all the downs in life drag you down with them. I'm always amazed when we come to a medical clinic that we can come out to a, a field or something that there's absolutely nothing and it becomes a well-oiled machine of, of medical care. How long have we been doing this? Uh, this is our 100th outreach. That's and, awesome. And uh, I want to see it's close to 10 or 11 years. 
walk us through how this process works for your team. Patients, they come in and uh, they, they wait in line. Um, from there, they'll go in at Weights and Thames and see a, see a nurse for, for triage where they'll ask their primary chief complaint. Um, what's the one main reason that you're here? How, how can we help you? From there, they're afforded the opportunity to either see a doctor or a dentist completely free of charge. Um, from a doctor, we ask every single patient that comes in, uh, can we pray for you? And then from there, once they exit, they come here and they receive uh, free medicine. Describe for someone watching at home what you see out here on a regular basis. What is it like? Some have the same our patients at home have, but we also have rare diseases we don't see in, uh, in Europe. And uh, I also have the experience that the patients here are very um, humble, they are very thankful, and um, they, they have the hope that you bring them some help. Uh, there was a man who was coming because he said he cannot see properly. So um, we tried glasses and I really uh, loved this moment when he put on the glasses and I could see that he gets really happy and then he just said, I can read. And I was like, just didn't want to freak out totally, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have to stay professional yes, and yet you're yes. so excited for yes. what's happening. That's awesome. Yeah. Are people impacted for Christ through what you're doing here? Yes, I think so because um, I do that because I love Jesus. I think they feel it. And yeah, sometimes we just pray right at the investigation table <laughs> just to make them know that Jesus is the doctor all above us. Yeah. Here at the medical clinic, we are seeing many people getting help that they've needed for a long time. And our wonderful volunteers here, they work so hard and we're just so grateful for all of you that make this possible. So right now, let me just ask you to be a part of everything that we're doing. Your special gift today can help lives in ways that you can never imagine. Together, we can make a big, big difference. So call us right now, go to the website, JoyceMeyer.org and give a special gift today that will help people not only here in Africa but all over the world.